little two little two two pounder. Nice man. Slammed it. There he goes. Hey folks, I'm getting ready to launch my Sea Eagle Fish Skiff 16. Uh, you've probably seen a video before where I used the Cruise 2.0. I've actually changed it. Now we're going to try it with the Cruise 4.0. In order to power that, I got two chargers there. And if we look in here, I got two of the, the Power 26 104s. So that is doubling how much range I have if I'm using the, um, you know, a, a two kilowatts, but I'm going to try using it at four. See what kind of speeds I get. This is one of the most efficient um, hulls that I've used because it's lightweight, inflatable, it's flat bottom, and it has this, this kind of split, um, split stern, which uh, these sponsons really act, you know, to, to keep the boat nice and flat. Um, you know, when, when you have an inefficiency of a boat where the, the bow raises and the stern digs in, uh, that's what slows it down. When it rides nice and flat like it's sitting here on the trailer, um, that's when you get your best speeds. So, lightweight, twin tail, flat bottom, everything's good about this. We're going to see what the Cruise 4.0 does um, on the Sea Eagle Fish Skiff 16. I am going to be doing uh, a little bit of tweaking and re-rigging of this boat with the uh, with some Yak Attack components. We have the switch foot um, little pads that are that are similar to this, but we're going to get get some new ones on there. We're going to run some gear track um, along here. We're going to get rid of this kind of mounting plate that I've used in the past. Um, I'm going to rerun my anchor line. I'm going to do a better job with the, the transducer, um, you know, the switchblade transducer. I'm, I'm going to be tweaking this boat a little bit more, uh, using it on some of our electric only waters. Today I'm not on an electric only. Uh, this is Lake Marburg in Pennsylvania. And uh, one of the nice things when you have a really nice electric only rig, doesn't mean you just have to use it where the electric only restriction uh, is. You can use it anywhere, so we're going to use it anywhere, and uh, we're going to see how fast this goes here in just a minute. I've already played around with the trim adjustment pin, tried a couple different positions, touched 10 mile an hour briefly. Let's see what I can get on this run. It jumps right up. You can see it's it's scooting. I'm going to scoot forward on the seat. I actually may be moving the... Uh, battery box forward even a little bit more but you can see pretty consistently I'm getting there's 9.8 9.9 there 10.1 and 29.30 so it's it's hovering right around 10 uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get the rest of the numbers and put it up there I think I am going to move my battery box on the weight forward because in order to get that 10, I had to really scoot forward on the seat to get that speed. So, but you can see it's, it's moving pretty good. I'll go ahead and get 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and uh, we'll, we'll look at all that. Uh, look at that range data. Right now I'm heading into a, a bit of a headwind, and let's look at the range. 10 mile an hour, 18.3 miles of range. Nice. And it's what's weird is it's only using it's it's not using the full amount. It's not using 4,000 watts. And I've calibrated the uh, the throttle. It's doing what it should. I think it's just that with this efficient hull and an eight eight horsepower electric outboard. We've kind of maxed out its efficiency. It doesn't. It, it would. It wouldn't benefit from any more power. So it's not asking for any more power, which is great because that gives you more range. 
So I think if I added another person and more weight to this, it would certainly, um, it would certainly get up into that, you know, over three, three kilowatts of use. So, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn around and uh, get the rest of my, my data set. I love a stick steer. I love being able to just whoosh, whip it around. It's one of my favorite things about this boat. How agile it is. All right, let's get the rest of these numbers. And then uh, I was just talking with John Hipsher of Yak Attack and uh, he's got some uh, switch pads on the way to me. I'm gonna do a little bit more rigging on this boat when I get it home. Get track all over it. Put a transducer mount. Do do some cleanup with with my uh, yeah with it the anchor wizard here just to get this out of the way. I'm gonna run it over here. Um, we'll see. It's it's uh, it's this boat's gonna get a little bit of a facelift here in the next uh, week or so. some storms rolling in. I want to do one last ride in this little cove. It's got no wind out in the main lake. We do have some wind hitting us, uh, but I wanted to acknowledge that I'm sitting way forward on the seat. I got to move the seat and the batteries up a little bit more, but I got 10.2. 10 got a little tweaking to do but 10.2 is the uh is the top speed i'm really happy with that so that was fun testing it today uh, i'll show you briefly uh i actually have it back here in the uh the garage i got them plugged in and i got both yeah you can't really see it real well but these are the the chargers and they're both doing their job i got the the light on saying that it's it's doing its thing and it's it's taking power and putting it into these two uh, power 26 104 batteries these are the older ones um, the the ones they have now there's a 48 volt power uh, 48 5000 and another one um, that's for the the cruise 2.0 which is a power uh, 24 3500 so 3500 watt hours it's it's more than those I think those are 26 85 is how many watt hours whatever it's a lot of power um, I'm gonna be picking away at the at the boat build I think next Thursday I'm out on the uh, Sassafras River um, which is a tributary on the upper um, the Upper Chesapeake Bay, uh, we're going to do some snakehead fishing uh, with my buddy Mike Naylor. But I want to get a seat in there for him, so I got the Millennium Marine seat that comes with these bolts. I've actually been over to Innovative Sportsman earlier today and I, I chopped them. He's got all the tools to do that, so they, they come a little bit longer than what you really want them uh, for getting this stainless steel um, the boat swivel on there. So I'll do that and, you know, get that on there and then pick away at some other things I want to do. Get that transducer rocking on some track um, with the Yak Attack um, switch pads. Get that glued on there. Uh, we'll see. But let me work on this. And uh, we're going to put this on the, on the box that had the, um, the chargers in it. All right, so these stainless steel swivels don't give you a whole lot of clearance in there so that's why I've had to take these these bolts that uh, that come with this 
but you know, give you enough room to, to go through the frame uh, and shorten them because otherwise the, the bolts are kind of poking through and you sit down on that and it's jabbing you. So Trey's got all the fun tools there and I just chopped them and grinded them. So I'll go ahead and get that on there. And then we'll get get this put on the uh, on the cover. I'm gonna go grab the cover and uh, just have that ready. All right. <clears throat> so if you look in there, you can see that I didn't even put the washer on there. I don't think I needed to with this. This kind of plate. I do have a washer on this side, um, but the idea is that when you start spinning on this, this is going to be attached to the to the uh, that box top um, on the boat for the the rear box where the the chargers we just saw are, are on. Um, we're going to have hardware coming through here, and you don't want to have a really big head. You don't want the heads crashing, basically. So as this rotates and spins, I've done it before and messed it up and had the two heads smacking into each other and you, you, know, you just have to have good clearance in there. So let me find some hardware to get this put on the boat and uh, I'll just put it directly on that surface, drill some holes in the wood and it'll be good to go. out of daylight and I know tomorrow it's gonna storm a bunch so I'll probably pull the boat up into the uh, shop there and work on the switch pad so we get some track on the boat but I think I'm gonna get one more turn on this started to come out um, I think we're in good shape as far as the seat I'll show you here in a minute the most important thing is just that you have clearance between those two those two heads um, when when the seat actually spins. Alright, last little turn. And let's again look right inside there and you can see this has a full spin and no no, no friction, no head-on-head -head friction in that in that gap. So. All right, let's see how that sits down on there. I think because I got my straps on, it's not quite sitting down flush. But I got room for the cords coming out there. Actually, that is flush. I, I think I will put a hinge on this, like I've done with the other one. Um, just to make it uniform, but otherwise I'm good. Got a good seat there. All right, I've been working on my uh, battery charger box and uh, passenger seat. Got it hinged out real nice here. So this is really the one I'm gonna get into the most just because I'll have my, uh, I'll pull my two charger cords out and, uh, and plug them in. But I'm gonna take a break from from working on it, I have a, a V30 propeller. So you can see that it's a little different than what's on there. So this one's a high speed prop. That is the standard one. Certainly you can see there's a lot more surface area on these blades. So I got a tip from two of my colleagues at Torquedo that, hey, try the V30 on there, see what happens. I tried this on the Cruise 2.0 and I didn't get any better speed. And somebody gave me a te technical explanation as to why that is. Whatever, we're just gonna stick it on there and, uh, and give it a go. I will point out just briefly after I, pardon the scanner noise, um, after I, take this off. Um, 
This is a, a rock guard that Innovative Sportsman, Trade Innovative Sportsman made for me. And he actually put a, um, he put a grass blaster on there. So he's in the process of making these um, a little bit more, uh, pr I'll just say production. He, he does a really nice job making these, making Delrin uh, parts that fit over there compared to this, this first version, which works great. Great rock guard, great grass cutter, um, but he's coming out with something that's a little bit better. But I think I'm gonna pull this prop off, stick this V30 high speed prop on there, get it on the water, see if we get better than 10.2 miles per hour. All right, here we go. Cavitating. I can hear it. That is, that prop is, it's a bigger prop. It's not all the way down in the water. We're using 4,000 watts, we're only getting 8 to 7. I'm gonna mess around with the uh, trim adjustment, see if that doesn't help. It's still not getting it. It's interesting. I am using 4,000 watts. I tucked it in a little bit. It did get, it went from that much below the surface to that much. It's still cavitating. It's still going nine. I think I'd rather run at 10.2 using 3,000 watts than use over 4,000 watts to go nine. I think in the right application, this prop makes sense. I uh, Somehow this isn't it, or either I, I haven't figured out how to dial it in right. I can hear it cavitating though. It's just, you hear that hollow sound. It's not good. Oh well, I'll put the other one back on. I liked it better because it works with, uh, you know, chopping through the grass pretty good and works with the, the rock garden grass blaster I had. Worth a, worth a shot. So I've had a, a depth finder on this rig before. I had the uh, just an aluminum board up there with everything uh, transducer hanging off of it, the monitor. I'll eventually get some track put up there. Uh, but today I'm working on putting the, the transducer um, back here. And I'm gonna attach the transducer. It's already on the Yak Attack uh, switchblade transducer arm uh, so that's ready to go uh, but I'm gonna be and I need a a track see what that mighty bolt is that attaches I need a track base on the inflatable and what I'm doing is putting this on here I'll be gluing this uh, to the surface here um, I'm actually putting this pretty far forward so that I can I can get back to this seat and if I need to reach back here reach down and uh, and kick that transducer up. It's going to sit about like like that where it's it's going to be right at the surface. I'll still be able to have the left side image. It's low enough. It's adjustable with this yeah, the transducer arm there. Um, but I have that that T-bolt is going to connect in uh, with this product. This is the Yak Attack switch pad flexible mount so in order to glue it on I, I have this this vinyl cement here uh, I have a whole lot of it uh, you can get smaller quantities than that it just happens to be what I've got um, I'm gonna be prepping the area I'm gonna I could use acetone but I had this goof off which I think is acetone based it's gonna clean that surface really good then I'm gonna sand it um, I'll probably clean it a second time with these shop towels and the goof off. Uh, and then I'm going to use, um, you can't use masking tape, I just happen to have some painter's tape and I'm going to kind of square it off and really have a nicely well, uh, well defined edge there. And you put the, the glue on both surfaces. You put the glue here and you put the glue here and I'm going to 
put that on there and then I can uh, once that sets up I can put the transducer arm and run my transducer wire up and do everything I need to up there the the eventual plan is to have multiple switch pads in different places and to run the uh, I think I'm gonna get some uh, some Yakutek gear track and run it from one to the other so if I if I have one you know if I have one there and then I have track running across to there uh, I can put a whole lot of stuff on there and that's really what I need to do up here for um, for replacing the board that I had going across there that just didn't look all that clean uh, I think I'm gonna put a multiple switch pads across here and get some track running across so I can put I don't know rod holders depth finder um, stand-up paddleboard um, holder whatever whatever you use track for I think you know I got this surface I should use it um, so let's start with uh, prepping the surface roughen up the surface and, and this is a little bit unconventional that I'll have multiple surfaces here uh, maybe not the best idea but again I'm, I'm trying to preserve the ability to run track along the um, the inside of this little paddle holder here uh, but to run the length of it just roughen up whatever I got here and then I will clean it up with the uh, goof off but I'm gonna rough that up rough up the, the inside of the switch pad as well I'm gonna put down the camera here and get both hands on it so I can do a better job than what I'm doing one hand while filming I'm just getting a little bit of this on there and I think that's going to clean it up real good. There was the dirt that was already on there, plus whatever I sanded off. Some of that is is the green of the, the uh, material coming off because I sanded it. I'll let that dry. Do the same thing for the underside of the surface here. Just get that nice and clean. We'll be ready to glue. <clears throat> the cement has the directions that you have to, it's imperative that you get it on this surface and the surface you're putting it on. And I think you're supposed to let it sit on there for, it says two to five minutes. I'm not going to let it go much longer than two minutes, I don't think. Um, it's a big surface. I'll flip it, put it on there, apply downward pressure, hold it for two minutes, and then let it set up and I'll come back. Um, it actually says that it should be... It says let dry two to five minutes and that's what it emphasizes that you're coating both surfaces so to make sure that I do a nice job with um, just having it be clean um, and not really bleed over the side I got the the painters tape here so I'm going to draw a box around that next Alright, I got it all roughed up, cleaned up, and lined up uh, with with the, the tape here. I will show you, you know, when, when I pull that off, that's everything I need to glue. Um, I'm going to show you one I did before. I actually did this some time ago. It was the first one I did, and I, I have these, these oars that I put on there uh, that are made by Sea Eagle. Very 
simple and effective oars and I needed to stick them on there. Um, but you can kind of see the after effect. This is the first first one I did. I did, did pretty good on this edge. Uh, come up this way, it's a little bit less messy in here you can see where it really gets kind of ugly as I get close. It's probably some of what's going to happen back there, but you get the concept. You're, you're limiting where this, this uh, you know, the cement can, can bleed out just so you don't have it so messy. The idea is to, to keep it clean. So I'm going to go ahead and pop this open and uh, start applying. Wait my two to five minutes. Slap it on there. Hold down on it. Maybe find something heavy to wait on it, but I think I'm just going to hold it. Gooey stuff onto the, uh, onto the hull there. I'm just using a shop towel because that's kind of what I got. I'm wiping from the outside in keep a nice clean edge. Second thought on the shop towel, it's kind of disintegrating. When I do this again, I'll have a brush of some sort. I'm just going to pour a goop on there. That's messy. Ooh. Yeah, I'll have to get some disposable brushes next time I do this. I can't remember what I used last time, but I'll wipe that excess off. Pitch the shop towel to the ground. Wait my two minutes. Yeah, I think we're approaching five minutes on that surface, and this one's been over two, so. Let's stick it. One shot, and I fortunately have the uh, painter's tape. <clears throat> All right, starting in the middle. And then kind of working my way out. Hopefully, as I Start in the middle, work the way out. I'm releasing air as it gets towards the edge. This is probably the worst example of where you should put this because I have one, two, three surfaces that I'm going on. It really should be on something flat, but you know, this for the most part, it's not like I'm lifting the boat on this. It's it's holding the transducer in place, so I think we'll be okay. Yep. All right, so. I'll let this sit a little while and then I'll come back and we'll start working on the uh, running the transducer line but let's take a, another good look at that yep I'm happy with that okay just fit my t-bolt in there slide it in there Unfortunately, I'll be blocking the use of this this uh, paddle holder, but I think I'll be alright because I've I've got um, got some other Yak Attack products that'll help me do that once I get the full length of track all around this boat. Uh, it'll certainly help me with that. So for now, it just kind of braces that in place. Got to do a little bit of adjustment to figure out how I want this. This angled and just tighten it up with these these Allen screws here but we got a good base here I'll make those adjustments and uh, you know I got my got my depth finder in there 
So the next two are uh, are gonna need to be a little bit stronger. I'm putting two of them together because they're gonna hold on to this big Humminbird Helix 10 monitor uh, with a lock and load base somewhere in the middle on a 16 inch uh, section of, of gear track. Um, it's, you know, I'll probably have a couple different accessories here, but the main one's gonna be this, this Humminbird Helix unit. So I do have them outlined and I'm really putting two of them together on track and they're on flat surfaces. It's, this one's gonna be, they have a lot more pressure put on it than the last one. So I'll uh, clean them up and uh, I'm actually waiting on the gear track to, uh, that I've ordered to get here. But I have these other pieces. I'm gonna get these switch pads mounted and they'll be ready when that gear track gets here. All right, so I got my 16 inch GT175. Um, I'll take that off the packaging, but you can see that's what our ultimate goal is. We're gonna accomplish that by using some mighty bolts and some wing knobs. And uh, I'm gonna drill some holes through there and there. And then when I <clears throat> go further forward, with another pad, another switch pad, um, I'll go in that direction as well. But <clears throat> the main concept is to to create a bridge between these two switch pads <clears throat> using the gear track. And I'm just going to drill a hole that's the diameter of uh, you know that that the, the uh, mighty bolt can fit through, and we'll put it on there. Then I have a nice wide base. This one happens to be uh, top loading, so I don't have to really come in the side like like this because the side is going to be blocked up with with this so let's start drilling get it on there then I think I'm gonna put more switch pads on going all the way around all right I got my uh, Dakota lithium battery up here in the in the box. Nice uh, 23 amp hour in that waterproof case, and uh, got it hooked up. And you can see, I've got let's see, tie down eyelet, the cup holder, the base for the the depth finder monitor, uh, the tie down strap. I can put all kinds of stuff on there now. So uh, I got my. Over grip, which is going to figure prominently tomorrow. Uh, hopefully, we get some uh, snakehead and uh, largemouth bass. Definitely need a boga grip. So that's it. I'm going to keep uh, seeing what I have time for getting more of these on here, and uh, we'll we'll keep going, keep rigging this boat out. Looking forward to getting it on the water. Mike, I'm on a, uh, I'm just going to say a Maryland Eastern Shore River, Tidal River, with my buddy Mike, who works for Maryland DNR. You do a lot of work out here with subaquatic vegetation. Yeah, we're out here a lot during the year together with uh, Sassafras River Keeper Zach Kelleher. We come out and look at SAV beds on the river, submerged aquatic vegetation. We Zach does a tremendous amount of water quality monitoring both looking at the environmental health and also the health for people who want to swim or fish or boat on the river. So uh, Sassafras River is one of my favorite rivers on the eastern shore and I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Nice. Mike, you're running the, the 8 horsepower Torquedo Cruise 4.0. What's your impression of it just right off the bat? I've never been on a vessel like this. It's just incredible how quickly you're moving down these flats that I'm usually paddling at, at two miles an hour. And we're covering so much ground today. It's just, it's unbelievable. I've never been on anything remotely like it. It's like having a small gas engine on the back. I want one. <laughs> I really want one. Yeah, the Sassafras River Natural Resource Management Area has all kinds of native grasses growing throughout, it, throughout the property. And you can see here, to the right, with the brown tops, is Phragmites, which is an invasive species. Um, there on the left, with the smaller, brighter top, is wild rice, 
Um, it's a it's a kind of grass that used to be harvested by Native Americans as a staple food source, and it grows throughout Sassafras River NRMA. Oh, it's a nice snakehead on the, uh, that was on the jackhammer. I gotta get a boga grip on this guy. Um, man, man. We were throwing up into the, uh, into the branches here. This guy came out and jammed it. So, all right, it's a nice, uh, about a nine and a half pounder. Not quite 10 pounds, so. Beautiful fish. I'll get a measurement lengthwise here in a minute. I can put it right on the side. Sea Eagle Fish Skiff comes with these, uh, these markers on the side. And get a rough estimate. It's a 30. Yeah, 30 incher roughly. So slimy. You a slimy big mama. Okay. I would like to have my jackhammer back. May I have that back? Can you not bite down? I even promised to let you go. I don't want to mess with cooking and cleaning you. Hmm. Okay. Alright, hopefully we get a couple more like this. Nice nine and a half pound, 30 inch snakehead and uh, hitting the hitting the Z-Man jackhammer. So we're not keeping them today. I'm just, uh, we're just out here having fun catching them. See you guy. Away she goes. So she was on this, somewhere in this wood complex here. And uh, you know, for, I gotta retie this because I'm sure this is all chewed up, but the jackhammer, uh, this is a gold, I think, 3 8 ounce, and I got a, the, the Z Man um, swimmers um, just as a trailer. So it's nice because they, they track it real well, you know, that, that vibration of the blade and the boot tail. Uh, I don't think they have really great vision, so giving them something that, 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 that blade kicking in front uh, gives them something to track with their lateral line and they jam it and it's it's always a real good hookup percentage with these. A lot better than the, the hollow bodied frogs that we got back there, but they're fun anyways because you get to see them blow up. But I'm gonna keep throwing this after I retie. All right, we've talked about a couple of the uh, the different plant species in the, what do you say, littoral zone, the, the edge. Mm -hmm. Shallow waters. Yeah, but we're going to talk about, and we have some examples here of subaquatic vegetation, some of the more common ones you find in Maryland. I'll let you kind of yeah. take it from there, Mike. In a lot of the shallow tributaries of the tidal freshwater Chesapeake Bay, you can find huge communities of macrophytes, of macrophyte plants, vascular plants that grow underwater. Um, and we have some good examples here. These are sort of the building blocks of life in aquatic ecosystems. These provide the habitat for young fish, it provides food for waterfowl, muskrats, and, and a lot of other animals that use the water. So I'll just go through some of the more common ones that we see um, in tidal freshwater parts of Maryland. This is wild celery, this is a native grass. Um, you can actually see little tubers there that'll almost like a little potato that'll overwinter and come out again to begin to grow next year. This is identifiable by its very long, narrow, tapered leaves that they can be three and four feet long up out of the water. Every leaf originates at the very base of the plant. It's not branched at all. Pretty easy to identify. Nothing else really looks like that. Another one everybody has seen is, is hydrilla. Um, hydrilla has a few look-alike species, but it's real easy to identify. If you look at a single whorl of leaves, you can count five leaves going around the whorl, and the leaves have teeth on the margins uh, all the way around. So strongly two, then five, you know you have hydrilla. If you see three leaves, that might be uh, Elodea, a native species that grows around here as well. Uh, another very common species throughout Maryland is coontail, Ceratophyllum. Um, this sort of looks like a raccoon's tail. If you see it in the water, it's sort of brushy, round. It's a very coarse plant. 
Um, it doesn't need to grow rooted, it'll grow perfectly happy just sort of floating around in the water so you can find huge concentrations of this sometimes in different places. And the last one that was a terrific problem in Maryland in the 1960s but isn't such a big deal anymore is Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, it's really easy to identify milfoil. Each leaf uh, has the little leaflets arranged like a feather. So if you see a single one with a central stem and then a bunch of leaves coming off in a feather shape, that's Eurasian water milfoil. And we are sitting here and finding all these plants in the middle of a giant bed of Native American lotus. Um, and this has a beautiful flower for much of late summer. It actually just quit flowering here about a week ago. And you can now see the fully developed seed pods. Um, these pods will stick really far out of the water and inside these pods you can find the individual seeds. And those seeds will can drift around in these pods for weeks at a time and all of them slowly fall out and spread around the river. Um, this has uh, become a problem in some tidal freshwater places in Maryland for water recreation because they can block in a dock, they can make it hard to water ski in an area and things like that. But it's certainly a beneficial plant to wildlife. We like to see it. It provides great shade. We've been having some luck seeing the snakeheads and their fry balls just kind of moving around in it as we fished along. Uh, so there aren't a whole lot of places in Maryland to have tens of acres like we're seeing right here right now. But if you look around, look on Google Maps. It's a very distinctive signature of this plant. It looks really bright green on Google Maps. And you can sniff it out from the air and then go and fish it and you will find fish in it for sure. I just dropped it on his back. <laughs> Surprise! I don't think they usually behave as though there's something higher than them on the food chain. But you can spook them. Same, same jackhammer, um, just keep pushing it up into the wood and we're getting, getting some nice fish. Beautiful animal. Let's see what the, uh, the weight is on this one. I'm guessing close to four. I'm going to, actually I'm going to say three and a half. It's three, three ten. Very nice, and uh, it's about uh, probably 18 and a half at three and a half. Good one. If you look in the marsh here off to our side, you can see a lot of different seed producing grasses. There's smartweed, there's knotweed, there's wild rice, there's, there's some kind of other large large grass, I'm not sure even what that is, and everything has a seed head on it. So it's easy to imagine why the waterfowl find these kinds of freshwater marshes so critically important in their migrations. Because these are, it's like a bonanza buffet. And they roll up here in the fall and all the seeds have just dropped off. They can eat like crazy for weeks and fatten up for the, to continue their migration. Good largey. You might hand me a shot right here. I did not get that shot. Oh, look at that. We get some good ones here. Just winding and chucking the jackhammer. Hello, fishy. All right, I'm going to pull the Plug on that, and get that hook out. It doesn't even seem like it's it's in them that much, but it's down near those gill arches, so I'm being careful. There, that that's getting all of them. Beautiful fish. Getting some good ones today, man. All right, let's get a length on here. Start you at 10. Oh, he's, <laughs> he was on that 30. So 10 to 30, that was a 20 inch fish. So, getting some good ones. Kill the motor.
How bad are you going to freak out? Hmm? You going to jump? No, you're going to be good. For how long? Oh, look at him shaking. Look at him shaking. He's like, oh, you don't even know. It just vomited on me. Oh, what is that? What is that? Gosh, I don't know. Could be anything. What's up, Barfer? You're fat. You have not missed a meal. Have you? Mmm. A little over six pounds. Nice. <laughs> Beautiful fish. Mm. Take a look at those teeth. Nice chompers. You got a little bit of that skirt, didn't you? Yeah, there's pieces of skirt in them. Not gonna be anything left. That's all right, as long as it's still catching fish. See you, guy. Oh, sticky. I'm pretty sure that's its poop. <laughs> okay, another species. <laughs> you never know what you're getting in the upper bay. Snakehead. Large mouth for these guys. Hi. How big are you going to get? All right, go get bigger. What'd you get? Nice. So, we've hopped up, beached the boat. We were in this creek earlier and it was full. And uh, we're just walking up and Making some casts. Probably a little two, little two, two pounder. Nice man. Slammed it. There he goes. Back in his hole. I left that honey hole. I came up and I threw it right, right in that, right behind that wood there. Yeah. He's right here behind this little stump. Slammed it. Very cool. Some nasty weather coming in here pretty quick. It's nice to be able to get out of here in a hurry. I think we may have one or two more spots to check out near the ramp, but we ought to get off the water quickly. You work on the water a lot when this stuff comes up. What's Is there an actual policy on what you're supposed to do? Or No, no you're on your own. It's you just figure weather. it out. Yeah, figure it out. Okay. Get back to the dock. Right. Don't make somebody else come out and get into the rescue, but. Makes sense. <laughs> 